absolute pleasure. Thanks for thanks for having us on and thanks for giving us the the feature for this month. Um, nice to meet some of you guys who are on screen. Um, and yeah, hope if if there's anybody watching on after this is recorded, hope it's uh, uh, can say hello to you in the future sometime too as well. Um, so yeah, my name's Murray. Um, my role at Lindors is the the brand ambassador and UK sales manager. Um, so I have the a really enjoyable job of getting to sort of travel around the country and, and meeting people and talking to them about Lindor's and its history and the whiskey we're making. Um, obviously, over the last couple of years, it's been a bit more like this, a lot more like sort of virtual interactions, which is, it, it's it's great too. It's, it's been brilliant to get to meet like a, a wider web of people that I might not normally see and then getting to sort of bump into you guys at like, things like whiskey shows around the country and things. It's always nice when we've had a chance to have shared a virtual dram together beforehand. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I want to give you a little bit of the sort of the background of Lindor's. It's, uh, we are a new young distillery. Um, I'm not sure how much people already know about the story of what we're doing. Um, it's the center of my universe and the people that work there, but we are just a very small drop in the world of whiskey. Um, so the, it, it, we are new. We've got roots that go back to the very origins of Scottish distilling, but um, I want to kind of like just let everybody kind of know like where we're at. So this our kind of story sort of starts off in a in this century anyway, um, where about sort of twenty odd years ago, um, a gentleman came knocking at the farmhouse door of Lindor's Abbey Farm, uh, which has been owned by the Mackenzie Smith family for the last hundred years or so. Um, it was Drew Mackenzie Smith, his dad, um, Ken, who was at the house at the time, and answered the door to this gentleman who just said, can I have a wee look around your back garden, please? So the back garden of the, the farmhouse was an old 12th century ruined abbey, uh, which was Lindor's Abbey. It was destroyed during the Reformation period in Scotland. So for the last half a millennium, it's just been like what you have in your mind as this beautiful, overgrown fairy tale of a ruin all covered in ivy and trees and just something that looks like it's kind of been lost to time and for the last like I say the last several hundred years it's just been the back garden so to speak of the farmhouse it's where the um, Kenzie Smith family just they, they would graze cattle in there every so often if they need to keep the horses there um, away from other things they used to often keep the bull in there and uh, so it was just not, not disrespectful for an, an old place but there was nothing really kind of nobody was coming to visit it so this gentleman knocking on the door was a surprise to, to see that somebody wanted to come and look at it and uh, Drew's dad was like yeah sure go have a wee nose around if you like but like be on just mind your feet the bill was in there yesterday and so Ken watched this this jet lad from the from the kitchen window and he swears he saw him kind of like taking some notes and uh, taking a couple of pictures and he's adamant I think to Drew that he saw him listening to the rocks at one point and thought he was just a bit of an oddball historian who had a thing for old abbeys. Didn't think anything of it because the gentleman just left and didn't say anything else but about six months after um, there was a signed book came to the do through the, the door at the farmhouse and it was a beautiful hardback book entitled Scotland and its Whiskies by the late great whiskey writer Michael Jackson who was is still to this day revered as one of the best whiskey writers we've had and is often referenced from modern more modern whiskey writers as like a real sort of true inspiration of like bringing to light the words of whiskey and beer uh, and from a few years back so it was it was Michael Jackson not the moonwalking Michael Jackson of course um, who arrived at the abbey that day uh, and asked to have a look around and it then written this book, sent it to the, the farmhouse and in the flyleaf of the book it said, thank you for letting me walk around your back garden. Uh, turned to page 127, uh, the family opened the book at 127 and it had a nice picture of their back garden of an uh, area of the abbey and at the title, at the top of the page it said, for the whiskey lover it is a pilgrimage. So this was all a bit seemed all a bit bonkers to be honest to the family they were like why is this guy written a, uh, a section of his book about our back garden he's describing it as the a whiskey pilgrimage for for whiskey lovers and um, they they read on a little bit through it and it was it became evident that Jackson for his new book had done a lot of research into a piece of history um, 
that at the time was fairly had been fairly newly discovered from a translation of what's known as the Exchequer's Rolls, the old tax records of the king. Um, somebody had done the arduous task of translating about 30 yards of parchment from Latin into English of the old king's tax records. And one little sentence in the middle um, that they had translated read in 1494 um, from King James IV to Brother John Carr, who was of Lindor's Abbey, eight balls of malt wherewith to make aquavitae for the king. Um, so this commissioning to Friar John Carr, uh, eight balls of malt would, is, is like a, a large sum of malted barley and aquavitae being the Latin for water of life, which was the earliest name we had in, this, uh, in our country for, for Ushkabi, which became known as next, which is the, the Scots or Irish Ushkabi Ushkaba for in Scots Gaelic and Gaelic for aquavitae, which is the water of life, which of course today we now call whiskey. So it's always been discussed about who invented whiskey. Was it the Scots or was it Irish? It's, a, it's an age old discussion or occasional argument over a few pints or, or drams in a pub. Uh, and it usually comes down to who used this term aquavitae first, the, the, the term water of life. The Irish do hold, hold winning to have that in, in writing before, but the earliest written reference to the term aquavitae in Scotland is actually this tax record from Lindor's Abbey, um, which is in 1494 with that commissioning to Brother John Corr of Lindor's. So we we never say we invented whiskey at Lindor's, but we're just very fortunate to be part of this really important piece of history um, for the for the country as a whole, but in terms of our our, our love for, for whiskey, the amber nectar, John Barleycorn, whatever you want to call it, uh, its earliest name in Scotland being um, in Latin, Aquavitae, in the earliest reference there at Lindor's. So this discovery really put the wheels in motion for a dream for Drew and, and Helen to, to one day perhaps be able to bring back something to pay homage to the monks for bringing this to Lindor's, um, for bringing the, the country its national drink. Um, be that just a shed in the field that people could come and make their own little pilgrimage to, um, but over the years, it became more apparent that you would like to Drew and Helen bring back actual distillery. In the earlier days of their sort of dream, the, the, the industry wasn't in a great spot, so it took a little while for their dream to come to reality. Um, the build of the distillery only began about seven or eight years ago, um, with its completing now about just over four years ago, um, with the there, our first distillation happening in December 2017. Um, so it's it's a patient game, whiskey. You know, sometimes when you're looking at bottles and you see things that say 12 years, 8 years, 21 years, it doesn't really kind of sink in until you've, uh, for me anyway, until I was part of that process of waiting a, few, a good few years before you've even got something you're allowed to legally call whiskey. So it takes in Scotland um, by law three years and one day of aging uh, malt spirit um, in oak casks before you can even give it the name whiskey. And um, so before it's called that, it's known as a spirit called um, new make spirit. So this is what everybody will have here, this clear spirit that comes off their stills uh, in a Scotch whiskey distillery. It's what's known as kind of the DNA of each distillery, everybody's will be very different, all using just three ingredients of water, barley and yeast. It's the only three ingredients you're allowed to make for at least three years in a day. It's pretty insane that for all of the whiskey distilleries that are in Scotland and all the different whiskies that each distillery make, that it's all just happening with those three ingredients, but it's very much the the process of what's happening, the, the character of the ingredients, the character of the people themselves who are making the spirit that will impart what you're looking for um, for the end product. So we are we just launched our very first single malt whiskey in July 2nd this year, which is the sample that you'll have with you here. Working at my camera angles there, I'm turning the bottle. Um, so this is what we have here. So this is the very first single malt whiskey uh, available to the general public 
from Lindores in over 500 years. So it's something pretty special. It's been a, a long time coming and it's, it's just been an absolute delight to have it out on the market. We've had this bottle here that you might get a chance to try if you win the, the wee competition that the gents are running, um, where you get a wee chance to try the new make spirit, the Aquavita and the whiskey in a little collection. And perhaps later on in other months, we might do a wee sort of tasting and sampling with this too. So our Aquavita is something really different. It's that new mix spirit that I was talking about there, just the, the clear spirit that comes off the still, but the aquavitae is then being rested with botanicals, spices and fruits. So it's kind of like a bit of a middle ground between whiskey, gin and spice rum. It's, it's really given you a kind of an idea of what the monks were making at Lindor's about around 500 years ago, because at that stage they didn't know about maturation. They didn't know what a barrel did. So they weren't waiting three years and a day to drink their spirit. They were drinking it straight away. And if you can imagine distillation processes half a millennium ago, it would be pretty harsh. So to make the spirit a little bit more palatable, they were adding botanicals, spices and fruits. Um, and in those days called it Aquavitae. So we are a Scotch whiskey distillery though. So with mm -hmm. our award-winning new make spirit, with it is the clear spirit that is, like they say comes off the still, already packed with lots of character, texture, flavour. Um, it was awarded last year from the World Whiskey Awards as the best new make spirit in Scotland. So the, the best new make Scotch whiskey, um, it, well, the best Scotch whiskey new make, essentially, uh, from a distillery in Scotland. So for us as a young distillery at that point, before we even released whiskey, it was a real fantastic accolade to have because the world was kind of seeing that we were we were doing things the way that we wanted to do and doing it properly because with all this history and excitement of what Lindors is in the past the stories of brother John Carr and the the, uh, the sort of going back to the very origins of Scottish distilling there at Lindors there was an opportunity I guess for us to go a bit Loch Ness monstery or um, like Greyfriars Bobby-esque and just go all about the story and release a kind of a slightly more inferior style whiskey that people were just there just to, as, a, as a touristy thing where we from the the very word go it was all about the quality of the spirit that was at the heart of everything we we're doing obviously we wouldn't be doing what we we're doing if we didn't have the history so we'll never ignore that but we wanted to make sure that we had a product that were coming out that was like paid homage to that to that history uh, and was as good quality as a product as the history we were lucky enough to have. So I don't know, if, hopefully a few of you have a wee sample that are here in your glass. And please, like we've, we've got quite a nice wee intimate tasting tonight. So if anybody wants to sort of chip in and let me know what you are thinking or have any questions at all that's going on, it would be, it's, it's great when it, we've got a small group like this, I can actually see people as well. It's not just speaking to a, a blank screen. So please like, chip in and let me let me know what you think. So to give you a little bit of background of the spirit of this whiskey itself, like I say, it just came out in uh, July this year, let's say this year, last year now, so July 21. Um, it's the first single malt whiskey to come out to the general public from Lindor's. It's a combination of our three core casks that we use at Lindor's. So it's a what's called a vatting, uh, which is using three different styles of cast, not finishing in each one, but you're just bringing three styles together, mixing those together to create the single malt style that we want. So that's a combination of um, bourbon casks, sherry casks, and one that's called an STR cask, an STR red wine bleach. These are old red wine vessels that have been shaved on the inside to bring it back to sort of younger, fresher wood retoasted, recharred, so still with a little bit of the nice caramelization you get from the wine sugars. And that gives you a really beautiful cask to just to give like a little extra punch of early maturation. So this, what we've got in the glass here is only just over three years old. Um, it's in cask for just over three years old, so about three and a half years old. And to a lot of people that sounds very intimidating because they, they may be used to talking about whiskies that are 10, 12, 15, 20 years old. And for a long time, there was always an assumption that the older something is, the better it is. And don't get me wrong, you get some very 
you get delicious old whiskies. That's absolutely true. Uh, and age does do a lot for a whiskey. But this is only three and a half years old. And I think if you were drinking this not knowing that at all, it, it doesn't taste youthful in any way. It's really soft. It's really juicy. It's got a beautiful creamy mouthfeel to it. Um, it's it's got nothing to kind of like jump out and bite you. It's like a really just easy going, beautiful drinking dram. It's nice and soft. So, cheers, slash, it's getting a bite out. Let's see what you think. Yeah, that's good. How you doing, Stuart? Nice to have you join us. I'm doing fine, thanks. Uh, sorry to take so long in getting here. It's the first time of trying the Facebook portal for Zoom. No problem at all. To use one of, trying to use one of these things to log <laughs> in and you've got to go along a numeric pad and then it's a whole keyboard on screen to get the, the thing in. It must have been about five times I tried before I got here. <laughs> no worries at all. I'm still I, I'm still getting used to it all as well myself. So but um, yeah, so what I was saying to the others on the screen there, Stuart, sure, is we're, we're just, just delving into the whiskey now. So you've not missed anything on the drinking part, so you're okay. You don't have to launch anything down you to catch up. So we're just delving into it now. Um, just saying that it's a, a beautiful young whiskey, but perhaps has the kind of the feel of a much more mature dram around it. It's got nothing aggressive about it at all for being a young dram. It's not fiery, it's not harsh. It's 46% ABV. Um, you, you're welcome to put a splash of water in it if you want, but I genuinely don't even think it needs any water. It's so it's it, it's so inviting, it's so gentle and juicy that you can enjoy it, I think, just uh, at the strength in the bottle. But like I say, you're, you're more than welcome to add a drop of water to it as well, if you like. So, Does anybody have any thoughts on, on the whiskey in the glass? Just what was the rationale behind uh, going to 46 percent um so we, we are a, a non-chill filtered product so the it's completely natural coloring non-chill filtration and at 46 percent uh, you're not getting any of that kind of that cloudiness that you're going to get from uh like one that's a, a lower abv and um, when i talk about chill filtration there's i mean i'm not saying that if anything is chill filtrated, if, if that is it, bad at all. It's just for us at Lindor, we're just wanting to have like a, a very straightforward, straight cut dram. Um, chill filtration, all that's really doing, if anybody is using that, is is giving continuity to a bottle. And a lot of times when um, it's going to other markets, especially, or even in Scotland too, or the UK as well, uh, if it gets cold, it might get a little bit cloudy or you might start to see some of the proteins in the bottle starting to cloud up or to, to, to form up a little bit. And to a lot of people who are picking up a bottle, say off of the supermarket shelf, the, to, I don't want to say the untrained eye because that sounds very like, like weird when you say something like that. But um, to, to somebody who's just picking up a bottle of whiskey as a gift perhaps and not knowing the background of whiskey, if you see a cloudy bottle like that through a clear glass, it, uh, there's, there's often an assumption that there might be something wrong with it. If the bottle ever does look like that of whiskey and you just give it a little shake up and it's sitting on a, a room temperature shelf, it'll look, it'll look fine. It's never going to be uh, bad for you or anything at all. But being above 46% um, helps with that kind of clarity to, to a bottle there as well. If you're not chill filtering like we're not. so And so, yeah, so it's got a beautiful, nice sort of light golden colour to it from that combination of um, American bourbon um, casks, uh, sherry butts, um, and sherry hogsheads, and the STR red wine. But it's just giving you a really nice balance of flavours there. Um, we don't use peat at Lindor's. Um, it's we use other methods for drying our barley. So there's no there's no sort of any there's no medicinal notes there. There's no like peaty like smoky heavy peaty smoky notes. It's a, it's a really nice drum for for people in getting introduced to whiskey for the first time, I think. Um, it's nice and soft and juicy, but it's definitely not boring. Um, we are in the, we're in the lowlands of Scotland. Um, so typically like a lowland style is that little bit lighter, maybe a little bit fruitier, more floral. Um, 
but the low, the lowlands as a, a, a category, I think, in, in in the past has quite often had the maybe the unfair kind of stigma of it being that kind of a, like often too light, which I think when people are thinking of whiskey, they often think of like really robust, like peaty whiskies, things like that. So for a lot of people, the Lowlands has had a bit of a bad, uh, a hard a hard rep for that, of it being too far to the lighter side. I really don't think that this is a, a boring whiskey, but in any means at all, I think this is, it's it's light and juicy for somebody who's, who's maybe not looking for that sort of like peated whiskey, but it, it's definitely got like a enough character enough um enough legs there to like keep drawing you in it's it's got that that really soft juicy like creamy mouth feel that we get from a variety of things that are going on at Lindor's so we have we use local like really good local barley uh, from Fife so we, we are where we are situated we are just on the banks of the river Tay so we are just on the south banks of the River Tay in a little town called Newbera. Um, and we are just outside of Perth, kind of across the river towards Dundee. Um, so about an hour north of Edinburgh. Um, we have some really fantastic sort of fertile farmlands in Fife that the industry as a whole have been using Fife barley for a long time. It's, it's a really good spot for the great, a great barley source. And we are of the. We are very fortunate that from the very start of our production, it's been a hundred percent Fife barley that we use. And now all the barley we use is within about half a mile of the distillery. And so we we're committed now to using the barley from our two neighbouring farms. So you can literally reach over and touch the barley. It's that close. So it would have originally would have been part of what would have been the full. Um, like the Monk's Abbey estate from back in the day. It's not all owned by a distillery now, so we're not a like, single estate as such, but it's as close as a, a sort of single estate that we're looking to be able to do. We really, we, we have a, a real passion for that locality, that traceability of what's going on there and doing our bit. We're not a full carbon neutral distillery but we're, we're aiming for everything to be a, a, a sort of heading towards that sort of like a little bit greener direction of getting things that are as close as possible. We do our maltings now with Crafty Maltsters just along the road from us. We mature our spirit as much as we can on site. So everything is, is very much trying to use, be part of that local area, local community for everything we're doing. So for the, what kind of makes Lindor's very different as well in, this, in the still room, in the still house, is we have one of the longest fermentation processes in the country. So this is the kind of the beer making process of what we're doing in the still house. It's, um, it's called, what you'll maybe be familiar with is called the wash. So when you're, once you've milled the barley, uh, it's had the water added to it, it's got a really, beautiful name called the wart <laughs> there's lots of like not so uh, not so stunning names in the the industry of like making whiskey so once you have your wart then you're it goes into our traditional douglas fir wooden washbacks so we have four traditional douglas fir wooden washbacks again as a as a modern distillery as we are we could have gone for stainless steel washbacks easier to easier to maintain they'll last a lot longer but we wanted to do some things with a bit of tradition to it as well, even though we are a modern distillery with modern styles. Um, we wanted to kind of keep a little bit of that traditional sort of approach to it. So we have um, Douglas for our wooden washbacks, which again, we feel adds some extra flavor to the wash when it's going on there. Um, we ferment for up to 119 hours, which for industry standard is around 50 to 60 hours for your fermentation. So around double industry standard. Um, that doesn't make a whole heap of sense to a bank manager because the quicker you make your, your beer stage, the wash, the quicker you can distill, the quicker it can get rid of that sort of bottleneck area and that still helps and get into casks for aging. But we're again, like I said from the start, we're, we're all about that quality of the spirit. And we, like we're, we're happy to put in those miles at the beginning and that patience at the beginning to give us the best possible new make spirit that we can possibly get. And it was 
fantastic to have that recognised for that hard work from the guys in the in the still house with that patience of of doing that for it to be uh, to be sort of credited with the best in Scotland last year, which is was fantastic. So once that wash happens there, we have a very unique style setup for our stills. So we have one large wash still um, and two small sister spirit stills. So it's not triple distillation, it's just double distillation. Uh, but what happens is it goes through the wash still at once and then it's split to the two, um, the two small spirit stills, fed from the same low wines and faints tank. And what this is doing is that having the two smaller stills for the spirit stills is allowing for much more gentle distillation, much, sl much slower, much more gentle distillation, and it's getting you double the copper contact, which is um, getting rid of some of the, the esters and compounds that we don't want in the finish to give you that much, a really light, and helps with that really creamy mouthfeel. So it coats the mouth well. It's not oily, but even on the nose, when you're having a smell, it smells rich, it smells creamy, it smells soft, it smells quite luxurious and velvety, just even on the nose. Getting that in on the palate, it's really soft, really fruity, very fruit forward again. And it's just like a, a really soft, juicy dram. There's nothing, uh, there's there's not any kind of angles to it, I don't think, that are going to sharp, be sharp to, to bite you at all. So, so, so Murray, with, with that process and the design of the distillery, Obviously, you had that luxury to, to, you know, design each element. Did you get outside help? Did, you know, what did you use as kind of your benchmark? And then to say, we're going to go for, you know, 119 hours fermentation rather than coming, you know, maybe being lower than that or even maybe even higher than that. I don't know. But, yeah, kind of where's all that information come from for you to make those decisions? Yeah, well, we... We had the the real fortune of having, and in, in the before we even put the stills or before the distillery was being made, the the lead consultant on the build of Lindor's um, was the the late great Dr. Jim Swan. I realise I'm not, when I when I get onto this, I, I realise I've now said late great twice. There's not a hope. There's not like a running. involved with Lindor's and then sadly passing away it's not, it's not it's not quite like that but we um we have like Dr Jim Swan uh, is revered in the industry um as as one of the the great sort of givers of knowledge to the whiskey industry uh, for his skills in distilling and especially in maturation um when I mentioned the STR cask earlier on that shape toasted and recharged cask it was a a kind of that particular recipe was like an invention of Dr. Jim Swan and um, Miguel Martin from, from Spain for, for getting that kind of recipe for that style of cast to really help like young distilleries bring out something at three or four years old that was as good, uh, could sit shoulder to shoulder with something um, of an older age of eight, 10, 11, 12 years old um, for a, a whiskey of the past. Uh, and with that is like so um, it was it was such a shame that Dr. Jim Swan passed away the, the, the day we were getting our stills put in. Um, so it's essentially like what is known as like almost like the ribbon cutting day of the distillery, not quite the day where we would be doing like the first distillation, but when it was really real and happening, it was it was there. So Mackenzie Smith, um, the owner and managing director of Lindor's, he'll he will quite openly say all the time that you know he's ne he'd never built a distillery before he didn't come from a, a history of like being passed down through generations of working in whiskey distilleries so is is he likes whiskey and enjoys whiskey but at the time his his knowledge of building a distillery was, was was quite limited and so with that he he wanted to give like not all the reins because he had a big part in it but he was he was sensible enough to trust people who knew what they were doing and employ the right people to, to make those decisions. And with that, with um, the money that was raised from whiskey enthusiasts from uh, around the world for the build of Lindor's, um, we had Dr. Jim Swan as the lead consultant. And one of his kind of statements at the start, I believe, was saying, 
if I need to dig deep in the pockets, will he make that happen? Because it was Jim Swan's sort of like dream as well for Lindor's to make the best possible spirit he could make from from what we had, from the size of the distillery and such like things. So for at the beginning of the journey, it was just going to be what two stills, one wash still, one spirit still. Um, but at, at, at a certain stage, Jim Swan came to Drew and said, remember, I, I asked, you know, for the kind of free license, a, a sense to to spend the money it would need for you to get the best possible spirit. And he he wanted for the, these two sister stills to be like something that would really sort of like set Lindor's apart really from a lot of other distilleries. And Drew will often like laugh about it in the sense that his admitting his ignorance around the building a distillery where he thought perhaps one like two smaller copper stills would perhaps be the same price as one larger one it's a similar amount of copper and things that are being used but that's very much not the case when it comes to for sites copper when it comes to for site whiskey stills the two smaller stills is pretty much the price of two bigger stills so it's uh, it added a little bit extra on to what was the thought as the original budget there but again it's just reiterating that thing all the way through the journey that the money was getting spent in the right areas to get the best possible spirit that we could do. There was nothing, we were never going to wanting to be pulling the wool over anybody's eyes to do with the, the history and things and trying to sell something that wasn't as good as our history. And so from that, that word go, it was decided there. But as I said, unfortunately, Jim Swan passed away uh, before we even started doing any kind of distilling. So we have our distillery manager, Gary Haggart, who is, was a former distillery manager at Crackenmore Distillery. And Gary and his team were essentially given a, a, an incredible toy set, uh, in a sense, to say, here's the tools, do as, do as you need to do to continue this. Because Drew and Helen were friends with Jim and his family, and after a reasonable amount of time had passed, after um, Jim Swan had sadly passed away, Drew had to make that difficult, sort of have that difficult conversation with Jim's family and say, can we have that file now, Jim's file for Lindor's, so, so we know what our next steps were. And the, the answer to that was that there was no file. There, there would have been a file and um, Jim, have been holding our hands through the first stages of the process and helping employing the, pe the people we needed to and wouldn't have perhaps been an active role in distilling every day but would have been there as a consultant to get us off the ground but that file didn't yet exist because it, it was in Jim's head and um, so that we knew a kind of through conversations that had, ha had happened we knew what the the angle that Jim was looking for but it very much then fell to the skills of of Gary Haggart and his team to kind of pick up the to no better way to describe it than really picking up the ball and running with it because they that's what they had to do and credit to Gary and his team they have possibly like outdone what Jim would have even had in mind from the from the outset because it was Gary himself who who felt that the the fermentation with just like a, a like the, that extra long fermentation would really do us wonders and so it was a combination of the original sort of plans from Jim Swan and Gary then taking over and in no way saying I'm not listening to Jim Swan things but taking that and having to make it his own because a distillery is a living breathing thing at itself at the end of the day is uh, as much as you can have an idea on paper for the theory of what that equipment should do once it's once it's fired up and it's steamed up and it's got it's got water and things going through it for the first time. It's got its own character. And that's something that you kind of have to work with as well. And for all the goodwill in the world of something before it's even been built, it needs that kind of feet, foot on the ground kind of guidance to, to put it into the direction you want. So that, that was the reasoning behind that. So what do you think, guys? I can see quite a few of you... Um, supping away there. Do you have any thoughts? Has, has anybody tried Lindor's before? Is this the first time you're trying it? Is this maybe the first time you've tried a Lowland style whiskey or 
what are your what are your thoughts on it? How do you feel? See, this this is I realize this is the first whiskey of a tasting. You know, sometimes it takes if you're doing it with like a group of tastings and you're on to your fifth dram and you can't shut people up. But everybody's a bit always a little bit uh, a little bit coy to like to to settle in. But feel free, please feel free to chip in. Like um, I'm a big boy, thick skinned. If you if you're not into it, you're welcome to say that. Obviously, like Ben will edit it out for the recording anyway, so it's totally fine. <laughs> it's all good. This, this is the first time I'm, I'm pleased that I'm pleased that Ben decided to go with yourselves and, and bring this one because I've actually got two bottles. I've got the commemorative and I've got the the later one that came in the run as well, which yep. haven't been opened yet. Perfect. So that's what we were saying to Ben earlier in the week, that uh, we'll, we'll open what I've got, or is that's going to be what's on tonight? So I thought, no, this is a, we'll try this one. Excellent. What, what's yeah. happening next week, next, next month? Well, I, th I think um, if we're continuing on, I'm sure Ben will give you some information on that at the, at the end. But yeah, when you were when you were talking about the commemorative bottle and like the liquid you got there, um, we did something a little bit different as a young distillery in the sense that we really wanted people to have the opportunity, like you're doing just now, to to drink the whiskey. Um, it's I, I look after the the sales in the UK, and I can tell you, it's really exciting to see bottles sell, but it doesn't even come close to the excitement and the pleasure of watching people opening a bottle of whiskey and drinking it or sending pictures in of an empty bottle saying like you know me and a few friends drank the full bottle on on friday and saturday and just talking about how how moorish it is and when i use i often use the word sessionable and that's not me trying to encourage people to jump on a, a drinking session by any means but you get some drams out there that are that are really robust, really heavy, and are like super special drams that you might bring out the cabinet once or twice a year, or a few times a year. Maybe you've got like a, a whiskey drinking friend comes round, and you, it's a special occasion you want to drink that, um, or you can have a drink. You can have a dram like this from Lindores, which is our, our core, which is just so easy drinking that you can almost you can almost treat it like a bottle of wine. I'm not saying again. I'm not saying like have a wine glass of whiskey by any means. <laughs> but I'm meaning along the lines of if you've got a group of people around the table, you can have a couple of drams and you can pour a couple more. And it's not, it's just, it's just very easy going. And it like as whiskey should be, it's a it's a conversation piece. It, it gets the conversation going with people. It's got a beautiful wee story behind it. But what's more important is that it's just it's easy to come back to and it's it it brings you back in for more. The, once you've had a dram of it, you have a second and it just, you're finding some new flavours in there that are like, like sneaking about in the background a little bit. And it just, it's just nice and soft and gentle. And like I said earlier on, it's, it's a perfect dram for somebody trying whiskey, maybe for the first time, or even for somebody who's tried hundreds of whiskey. It's a beautiful one to suit there as well, because it's, it, it's got enough complexity going on there to like really bring you in. But when you mentioned commemorative, what we did was very different was um, we brought out the commemorative bottle and the core bottle at the same time, it had the same liquid in it. So it wasn't two different styles of whiskey for the commemorative and, the, and what I say the core or the flagship or just, I don't like to use the word standard because it makes you think that it's a, a standard or an inferior whiskey, but our, our classic bottle, should I say, and the commemorative label bottle, exactly the same liquid that was in it. And the reason we did that was because had we just done commemorative bottles, um, we could have, we might as well have just put cold tea in it. We knew there was going to be a really high demand for the first <laughs> bottles coming out, and 95% of those commemorative bottles would probably not be opened. And we really, we were so excited by the quality of our young whiskey that we wanted people to not just be buying it, but be opening it and talking about it and getting that discussion going. And people, and the, the feedback from it was great. You know, it was, if people wanted to get a commemorative bottle for collection, then they could do. And if they wanted to get one to keep and one to open and drink, and they, they were scared about opening that commemorative one because I, we're not we're not in the market for encouraging people to collect. But I know myself, once you look at a website and you can see that a bottle is worth three times as much the following day after buying it, you feel edgy about opening it. So as mm -hmm. as much as we want people to drink it, we knew that that would maybe be the case. 
So we wanted to give people the opportunity to to drink that and and get and get involved. And if, if there were some people out there who just don't care at all about collecting whiskey and they just want to drink good whiskey, then it meant that the bottles were available there that you didn't have to elbow people out of the way to get a hold of it because there's loads of delicious whiskies out there that they come out in small numbers and the people who are making it aren't wanting people to put it in the attic. But unfortunately, the demand is there so much there for collecting for a lot of these whiskies that there's not enough people trying them. So hopefully, um, being able to do things like this and jump on with the guys at the Whiskey Nest and things and do online tastings and get those bottles split up and get to a wider audience that people can drink these spirits and be excited by them and come back and get another one when it runs out. So that's... Dave, you, I think you were going to say something, were you? A minute, yeah. a wee minute. Oh. It's, it's very accessible, I think. It's uh, got a real sort of tasty flavour to it, but it's not overly complex or intimidating in any way that some, you know, peaty whisky sometimes get or anything that's... Uh, so you, you're right, it's uh, very, very drinkable. Getting down a large quantity that's quite quickly because yeah. uh, it's it, it's got a tasty flavour without being uh, overly uh, difficult to drink or anything more. Yeah, else. absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I like the word you use there of accessible because it is very accessible. You know, it's um, when we're talking about it, it's a really odd one like, to describe. Um, it's something that gets said to me a lot at whiskey shows or when I've worked in whiskey bars and things in the past is especially in Scotland, definitely Scotland, the UK as a whole anyway, but especially in Scotland, I would never hear with any other spirit category, I don't think, people say, oh, I wish I liked whiskey. Um, and you'll be like, what do you mean? Like, oh, I wish I liked it. I just, I just can't get my head around it, you know, and you ask them a little bit more what they mean by that. And a lot of it is that they're, there, is, there seems to be a bit of a patriotic obligation in Scotland especially to, to try and like whiskey and to try and drink whiskey in a way that people's grandfathers drunk whiskey or their, their grandparents, their grandmothers would drink whiskey and that kind of, there's a lot of, like we, uh, we're sitting drinking neat whiskey here this evening which is, is great and it's a great way to drink it but there's, there's a lot of um, a lot of fear around drinking whiskey from a lot of people that are trying whiskey for the first time, especially. There's a lot of people think there's too many rules. They're scared to ask questions. They're, they don't want to offend someone. They don't want to be seen to be drinking it wrong. There's not that many other drinks out there that if you poured yourself a glass and drunk it, that somebody would look at it and be like, oh, you, you, you've done that wrong. You've made a mistake there. But that's like the feeling that a lot of people have that they think others are going to say that. So some people are scared that they're going to ask for the wrong mixer they're going to ask to put water in it or ice in it the bottom line is that people can drink whiskey however they like and it's all about ind individual tastes and nobody can tell you what is going on in your own taste buds and how you like to drink it people can can offer advice of how they think like the, the reading the room of how people would like to drink it but definitely with that kind of um, myself, my first, my earliest memories of whiskey, like many people, I think was probably raiding my, raiding my mum and dad's drink cabinet when I was probably too young to drink and having probably a, a full glass of something like Lefroy from the whiskey cabinet. And, you know, for years as a, as a teenager and into my early 20s, was probably was put off by whiskey because I had that. And it wasn't until like you're, you can get into the right kind of venue, the right kind of bar and see that there, there's 400 bottles behind a bar and have somebody in the industry like, you know, explaining that there's flavors from tropical flavors from coconut and pineapple right the way through to things that are really robust and heavy, like your peat and your smoky whiskies and everything in between. So there is a whiskey out there for everybody. And I think what's in the glass here from Lindor's is something that's accessible, like Dave said there. It's a really good word. It's accessible to people because it's not giving you the extremes of either end of the spectrum. It's, it's, not, it's not being super safe because it's got lo lots of complexity and lots of things going on there. But it's, it's nice and it's, it's 
it's got nice, easy flavours. Nice and soft, nice and juicy. It's got those really nice kind of uh, like soft caramelly notes that are there from your and your nice little touches of vanilla from your bourbon cast here. And it's got a lot of fruit that's going on from those long fermentation processes. They're going to give you those really ripe, juicy fruit notes that are there. So we've got that kind of nice candied toffee apple almost kind of note that's going on in, in the dram. Lots of citrus, lots of like sort of lemon and lime zest that's going on there and lots of hedgerow fruits as well, things like strawberries. And with that creamy texture, it's got a really kind of nice strawberries and cream, um, raspberry ripple-y kind of note that's going on with it as well. So it's, there's lots going on, lots going on for a, for a little dram of whiskey that's, again, made from just water, barley and yeast. It's, it's, a, it's always, when you bring it back to the bare bones like that, it's, it's pretty crazy that you get so much just from those three ingredients that there. What about anybody else? Anybody getting anything that they, were, they weren't expecting? Is there, is there anything on there that's is, is pleasant? Is this the type of dram that you normally drink? Are you, are you used to drinking it in any other ways? I thought, I thought strawberry. And I thought maybe yep. that's a stupid one. And then you said it and I was like, oh, I'm glad you said it. Because, yeah, I really got a good strawberry out of it. But oh, that's good. For me, I think it's one of those drams. And we've had a few of them where it, it almost opens up as you drink it as well. So you get that first try of it. And it's definitely got more than some of the other lowlands that I've, I've tried. But as I drink it, it, like you say, it just you keep getting different layers. And that's what I really like about it. Um, and I say we found a few drams so far on the journey where... They just continue to open up for you and that's what i love about it is is you can just you can just keep going and it can keep changing and i think then sort of putting it into you know maybe putting it into a high uh, you know a long drink or mm -hmm. having a cocktail with it as well and just seeing how that changes the flavors as well is 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 really in interesting to me so uh, yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely. It's, it, it's definitely got definitely got room there to get into the the mixology world for just from anything from nice easy highballs just over ice with a little bit of soda and and taking it into to further steps there as well and it's it it's got real real sort of delightful depth to it i think that it's coming all the way from the new make spirit that the the new make spirit is just it's of such a good quality and the casks that we're using again through that through that sort of connection that was made in the industry from Dr. Jim Swan with his access to the friendships he's made from the respect that the people have from him in the industry, um, that we, are, we have the, the access to some of the best fermentation vessels, uh, maturation vessels, sorry, some, for casks that the, the industry has to offer. So I often describe a cask as maybe like an amplifier if you're putting it into a kind of musical sense. You can't play bad music and make it louder and think that by making it louder that it's going to be better music coming out. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So you need to have that that real sort of marriage of a very a good quality new make spirit going into good quality casks. If, if it's not right, you're not you something's going to be lost along the way. Casks could do a lot of things for whiskey, but they're not like the casks are not don't have this kind of magical ability to just make any old new make into something fantastic at the end and the same for the a new make if the casks aren't right no matter how good your new make is your casts are going to take it into the wrong direction so having very good quality new make and very good quality casks puts, puts Lindor's onto a really linear path of going to good things in the future and then just in terms of um sort of other serves do you have you had many other serves with this is there any that are particular favorites for you or that you've had feedback around that work really well with this whiskey yeah well we had, we had one um it, 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 it was it's called a clarified milk punch it's maybe a, a bit a bit out there for making at home um but they, we had guys from orchid and aberdeen do that for a whiskey festival in aberdeen and it went down really really well it works really well in just a kind of like a classic kind of like whiskey sour style drink. Um, and as well for our Aquavitae, if anybody is is getting a bottle of that too, that that's a, really is a spirit that you can take into hundreds of directions as well. Um, the Aquavitae is kind of like a middle ground, like I said at the start, I think, between 
whiskey, gin and spice rum. It's not taking those three spirits and mixing them together. It's just when you, if you're drinking the Aquavita, you're going to get, uh, your, your things are going to be familiar of those kind of categories. And it's kind of liaising between those sort of different categories that are often miles apart. Um, and so you can really go into your kind of different cocktails that you'd maybe normally drink with rum, with vodka, with gin, with, and you can use Aquavita instead. The Aquavita makes a fantastic, is fantastic with coffee. It is great in like a sort of Irish coffee style serve. It's, um, it's good with an espresso martini. The sort of simple serve that I would suggest for the Aquavita would be with ginger ale. And the same with the same with the whiskey as well. I think the I think the best mixer for the whiskey is literally just soda. Uh, it's it's a really nice light whiskey. It's but got that real sort of depth of character and those fruity notes there really kind of accentuate with just a little bit of soda in it as well to make it a little bit lighter and more refreshing. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, again, like I said earlier on, people have the fear of because it's a Scotch whiskey, a single malt. They think it's going to be bad, but we owe a whole lot of gratitude for the Scotch whisky industry to other cultures in the world who are not so shy about mixing. People are always very surprised to hear about other cultures who drink Scotch whisky and how, you know, young girls in Japan will drink more whisky than Scottish men a lot of the time because they'll drink it much more, like, much more freely in the sense of going out for a, a night out and having like whiskey highballs, like whiskey soda, whiskey tonic, whiskey gingers, in a similar way that in the UK, we would much more be into drinking gin and tonics, gin and sodas, gin and gin cocktails. Whereas in the UK, I think whiskey and, and, and mixed drinks is coming along a long way, but we owe a whole lot of gratitude to other, other countries for really helping us along to, to edge us in that direction. What's the direction of travel for the distillery moving forward? Are they looking at aging casks? Is that the way they want to go? Or are they looking at different finishes on things? Yes. So we, we the three casks that we use the majority of the time for our core product, like for like the, what's called the MCDX CIB, which is Roman numerals for 1494. So obviously a lot of what we do at Lindor is all come back to that, that, that date of 1494 and the kind of, the, the, the thanks we have, I guess, for that that piece in the Exchequer's role. Um, so the three core casts we use prior, um, predominantly are bourbon, sherry, and the STR cast. But we aging in the warehouse, we have about 70 different styles of casts. So everything you could possibly think of um, that's had alcohol in it before that's legal to use for Scotch whiskey um, maturation. So, so things from port to rum to ex peated isla casks, uh, Calvados, you name it, there's, there's, we've got our whiskey aging it. We're a young distillery, so everything, people often talk about experimental things, experimental casks, everything for us is essentially experimental at the minute because we've never filled into casks before until, th until four years ago. Uh, so it's literally December 2017 was the first casks that we filled into. So from that day, everything that we've filled into has been experimental as, in a sense. Um, we will have what a lot of people call more exotic style casts that are a little more sort of off the beaten track for your, your normal whiskey, fill, like Scotch whiskey filling casts, like something like bourbon. So from, so different styles of rum, different styles of, different styles of port and sherry and wine from different regions of the world. Um, we have all those kind of things going on. So at the minute, the plans for the future for us, we've just we just released the, the first sort of general release in July. We've had a few sort of single casks and things like go out from the, just the distillery itself. Um, just before Christmas there in December, we did what was called the first one, the first in a little mini series of what's called the Casks of Lindors. Um, and that was focusing on breaking down those three elements that make up the core bottle. So the first one that came out in the Castle and Door series was um, bourbon. So uh, our spirit is aged solely in bourbon casks, which I believe we'll be having a, um, a little go on later on at some stage with the guys from the nest as well. So, so that, that, what that does is it gives, it gives people a chance to see how our spirit is interacting just with the, that one style of cask. 
Um, so it's not a single cask. It's again, it's a, a vatting of a certain amount of the same style of cask. Um, but it'll be a little bit higher. It's a bit higher ABV as well, 49.4 instead of 46. And a bourbon cask is it's often described as a kind of true neutral style, a very neutral cask, like the true neutral, neutral of, uh, of whiskey maturation. So it's not got very much, got anything really to hide behind. It's got a lot of time, if you have something that's very heavily sherried, you know, you're going to get a lot of that sherry influence there. Other styles of cask are going to have a big influence on it. A bourbon cask is something that's just nice and neutral that will give you kind of, a kind of the naked truth, so to speak, of what that whiskey is. And that's why we were really keen to get that bourbon one out nice and early, was to, to showcase just how good our new make is, even just sitting in a nice neutral bourbon cask. So, so um, I know that, the, that Ben um, that had some of those. And again, it's that, that one's a limited edition. So once it's gone, it's gone. We won't be sort of that won't come out again in a month's time or anything. Um, whereas, like the core, of the MCD XCIV will be one that'll be a continuously running bottle. Um, and then we'll have these kind of the next one, I think, maybe being the STR or the Sherry, and then vice versa further down. So by the end of next year, there'll be the, the three the three of the series will be out. So people will be able to kind of hopefully have the bottles in front of them and be able to try the different elements, make their own little mixes between it as well. It'd be quite good fun to do. But we don't, like I said earlier on, we don't use peat, um, peated malt, but what we do do sometimes to experiment with how sort of peat would influence our style of uh, distillation is we fill into ex-peated casks. Um, so we just had a, a really nice one out there that you may be some of you may have seen out in the market or already because um, they sold out just straight away. We, there's a, a shop up in, in Fife in Scotland called Luvians who did a market exclusive of our one of our uh, a bottling of Lindor's um, and it was from an executed Isla cask. And that was, again, just a really, really exciting little spirit, just a totally different style from our normal because we don't use peated malt. So it was giving a, a really nice kind of glimpse of our distillation style with a little bit of a, a sort of like malty kind of, uh, a little bit of a peaty kind of element to the run. So, because if you do use peat, a lot of people will say, do you have plans to do a peated run? If you, once you put peat through your system, it's, it's very difficult to, to get back to your true unpeated character. Um, especially because we use things like Douglas fir wooden washbacks, that peat, uh, the, the peaty flavour from that peated malt will penetrate like every nook and cranny of, of your setup. And it will, it's because we worked so hard to get to that quality of you making the style we wanted, it would be a shame if we were just doing peated runs every so often and losing out on what we wanted that sort of true DNA of Lindor's to be. So, never say never, it might happen in the future. It won't be my decision, you say. <laughs> How, how peated was it because i know there's a few places that do that that sort of finishing peated cast rather than as you say creating using like um you know peat in the actual uh, malting of, of, of the barley so yeah kind of where where do you think it sat in terms of peat level it was it, you, you can it was definitely there 100 percent. it wasn't just like a, a kind of a skimming it's there's definitely a big peated element in it but it's it's not going to be as as heavy as something that's fully like peated through the malting um process like of a, of a, a true isla malt it is a it was a fantastic cask from a fantastic distillery in isla that we, we used for this particular cask and it just gave you a, a really nice kind of green tobacco-y kind of note to it as well. It had like a kind of really kind of almost like a sort of sweet, smoky, sweet maltiness to it because we have a really like a quite a sweet fruity new make. So that um, that's, wouldn't, that's not being overpowered by, by the malt, uh, by the, the peat, sorry, um, but can sort of like dance about together with it like quite harmoniously it, it was it was something pretty special so when those are coming out again in the future if we're doing it from just Lindor's or from anybody else keep a wee eye out for those as something really different 
Our distillery manager, Gary, has got some ex-peated rum casks that he's already put little chalk marks on as, as category winners for the future when they get released down the line. He's so confident from them when they were at only one year old of how they were maturing along that he's essentially put his little um, his little mark on the cask saying that this is his future predictions of category winners from in the future. So there's there's lots of exciting things that come from indoors. And if you ever get a chance to come up, any of you, I know that um, the guys at the Whiskey Nest are doing their little competition that's giving some like tour vouchers and things too. Um, if you have a chance to come up, it it, it really is a, a distillery that's unlike any others. Um, it's I, I know that everybody will, will say that about the distillery, um, but we're, we, it's definitely not trying to force whiskey production down your neck in any way. It's very much a 50-50 with the, the whiskey production side of it and the historical aspect of it. It's almost like a it's almost got a feel of a kind of a whiskey distillery come museum in a way. There's lots of beautiful history about what the monks were doing out with their whiskey making like in the past and just all the things that they brought to the area from everything from bell making and beekeeping to literature and chess, things like that. So, and you can still walk around the old abbey ruins and we get a real feel for that that true sense of a pilgrimage, I guess, if you're interested in whiskey, it is a it is like Michael Jackson said in his book all those years ago. It truly is a, a pilgrimage for a whiskey lover, and it's like you, you, even if it's raining or bright sunshine, you'll still get that kind of goosebumpy kind of feeling when you're there. That it, you feel that you're somewhere special, especially if you're interested in whiskey, and it's also a good distillery to drag people along to if they're not interested in whiskey because there's. There's enough to do and see and be interested in without it just being about the whiskey making process. Probably an hour north of Edinburgh, um, so I'm not sure where everybody is located in the UK at the minute. That might still sound like a million miles away or a way up north, but in terms of Scotland, it's as an accessible distillery, it's, it's very easy to get to. It's not like trying to take a, a three day trip over to Isla or something like that. You know, you're not having or you're not having to go up to the to the very north of the country and get on little tiny windy roads you can from from edinburgh like from edinburgh you can take the train to perth or to dundee or to some closer train stations and then from there there's there's lots of easy bus link so it, it is it's still not you know there's not a train station right outside the distillery as such so as all distilleries in scotland are there's a little bit of adventure in getting to them but it's definitely one that's you can do in a in a day trip from Edinburgh or you can do it in a day trip from the north of England kind of thing you know it's the train lines that go all the way from Aberdeen all the way to Penzance and uh, so that you can get on that one train and come all the way up without having to change any trains kind of thing so um yeah it's and it's worth a visit and if you're going to see a if anybody was ever up and going to see a variety of ones of distilleries it's a really nice one to either to start on or finish on because you can it's access to the rest of Scotland is fantastic and Fife itself is becoming almost like its own little region and um, there's lots of fantastic distilleries in Fife now you've got ourselves at Lindores you've got um Daff Mill and Cooper and you have the like, King's Barnes and Eden Mill and so there's lot there's lots going on in Fife and it's obviously packed full of golf courses as well, so they always go seem to go hand in hand, golf and whiskey. Sometimes, if you're if anybody's into golf, and a great one as well. If anybody's having to be celebrate celebration dinner next uh, next Wednesday for the twenty fifth for Burns Night, um, it's a nice little whiskey to to crack open for that. Uh, Goes really nicely with um, for all your all your sort of courses from that everything from a, like a a Cullen skink like fish soup or something to begin with right through to your haggis if you're if you're being brave enough to crack open a ha a, a tin of haggis down there I don't know if your local butchers in England do haggis or not but uh, depends if the if someone's caught one on the hill that day or not you see <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah it's like I say it's a good it's a good little one for that and if you are doing a wee toast to the bard on to Robert Barnes on Wednesday it's a nice wee easy dram to do so nice all nice. good all good yeah, yeah if any, again if anybody has any wee questions to finish on or anything at all and I'm not I, 
not saying I don't need to go anywhere. I'll sit and have a bottle of whiskey with you, no problem. So we keep a wee look lookout for us, everybody. Um, again, I'm not sure where everybody's where everybody on the screen's from, but um, I'll be all over the country again next year at different festivals, um, at different spots all over all over the UK. So plenty going on all over England as well for um, for different festivals too. So if you if you're looking to kind of try a whole lot of different things as well come and see us and we'll always have little sneaky drams under the table and things too that if you're if you're ever there and we're there always remind me that i had a wee a wee tasting with you with a whiskey ness and i'll i'm sure i'll have something special under the table nice nice just a quick one for you murray um any food pairings that you would recommend with this yeah absolutely so it's um I don't want to jump straight in and say haggis, but it would, it'll go really well for haggis <laughs> uh, next week. <laughs> that would be a, a quite a ridiculous food pairing. Just be like, oh yeah, I have it with haggis every Thursday. Um, but it's it's I think it's great to go for it's it's an easy one for it throughout the whole day, so it doesn't particularly go. You know, you might have some wines that you say that goes really well with red meat. That ones for fish i think this is a, a really versatile little little whiskey so it works with the, lots of different courses if you're having it for dinner um it's nice and it's nice and sweet enough to have with dessert and coffee at the end of a dinner but and it's nice and light enough as well to have as at the start of a dinner if you're having it as like a little toast that, that kind of conception of having it that comparison to kind of wine like i said earlier on again it's not to encourage people to drink wine glass size measures of it but it has that kind of ease to go with it there so yeah any course of your meal um the typical things it's really nice with cheese and things as well obviously like but people will often try and pair different whiskies with different cheeses and um, so anything from a nice like a nice light creamy cheese will work really well right through to a nice really sort of like strong cheddar works really good with lots of cheese and biscuits too if i i can be testament to that for having plenty of that over the christmas period so Cheese and uh, cheese and chutneys and whiskies might not be at the. It's, it's what everybody's trying to shake off for January. So maybe I should say something like quinoa or something. You know, if everybody's on their their their, their mm -hmm. January health kick. You know, it goes great great with rice cakes. You know, if that's <laughs> what you want or like something like that. So, but yeah, it's really really versatile. We draw really versatile. Lots and things too. Again, lots of. It's an easy dessert, I think. So I think I think it works really well with things that dessert. If you ever if you ever got different ones to use, then or throughout the meal, I think it's good with dessert. For next month, I'll have a um, I'll put together a couple of wee food pairing kind of things for that what for, specifically for that one. So if there's anybody on uh, tonight that's on next week and they're looking for something a little bit different, I'll 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 gloss over the kind of the history and things about it as well and i'll have, have a few different points of reference to talk about with the whiskey too so i, di I didn't want to go into i didn't want to use all, all use everything in this this evening and if anybody is joining next week feel it was it was a, a similar evening so we'll, we'll do a couple a couple of food pairings and things and i'll i'll, I'll let ben know um ahead of that as well so that he, he can inform you guys of what what we might do with the a wee food pairing or a wee cheese or chocolate or something like that look forward to next month and i'm sure we'll catch up before that have yourself a good weekend and a good happy new year week. everybody happy new year as well absolutely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cheers everyone bye cheers cheers, cheers.